Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you this Thursday morning. We are here with a great, uh, another great virtual learning experience for our students. Today's, uh, this session is on a, a medical panel with two different doctors. You're going to learn a little bit about their careers and what they've done uh, to get where they are today. Uh, it's going to be a great experience for you to learn just what it's like in the medical field, especially in the times that we're living in right now. There's a lot of changes going on because of what's going on in the world. So we felt like this would be a great uh, session for you guys to listen in. As always, there is a chat box over there on the right. We are expecting appropriate behavior in the chat box. There is uh, an automated bot in there that will um, moderate uh, if you use anything like excessive caps, if you use too many emojis, things like that. So keep those to a minimum. Um, it, it's all designed for us to learn and ask questions. We want you to ask questions to our doctors. We have some questions that we've come up with, but your questions are always better. So please come up with some good questions as you're starting to hear the conversation and we will showcase your questions to the doctor. So. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to first introduce our first doctor. His, uh, his name is Dr. Vincent Apicella. And Dr. Apicella is a doctor, he's my doctor, from Wellington, Florida, here in, in Palm Beach. So go ahead and introduce yourself, Dr. A. Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Apicella from Premier Family Health in Wellington, Florida. Awesome. And I also have my colleague, Tasha, here. And Tasha has the great distinction of introducing our second doctor. Yes, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Lieutenant Commander Tashonda Burke. And you'll recognize the last names. That happens to be my sister. So go ahead and introduce yourself and tell everybody where you are chiming in from. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Burke Tashonda, and I'm a pediatrician. And I'm chiming in here from Naples, Italy. Naples, Italy. So, John, you want to show everybody how far away she is? It's about a six-hour difference, right? Six-hour time six difference. Hours. So it's, it's about um, it's five thirty in the afternoon here. Yeah, so it's five thirty in the afternoon. So awesome. when we get into um, the discussion about um, various careers, um, she'll have an opportunity to let us know some of the fun places that she's worked. Awesome. So Tash, Tasha, take it away with the first question. Okay, great. So um, the first question that I have for you too um, is what type of doctor are you? Can you explain to those listening uh, what what is it that you practice? Sure. I'm a pediatrician. Um, so I take care of babies and children and teenagers and even some young adults. And so I'm a doctor that provides basically general medical care from birth, including attending the delivery in the hospital all the way until approximately about 22. Um, the average age that my patients will transition to an adult doctor is somewhere between 18 to 22. Dr. A. And I am a primary care physician with, or a general practitioner. We're called a lot of things from primary care to family medicine. I am board certified and trained in family medicine. Uh, about I've been in practice for, this is going on year number 16 for me. And about five years into clinical practice, I went sort of back to school and received training in functional medicine as well. So I have a board certification in family medicine and I practice primary care, but I also am fellowship trained in functional medicine as well. That sounds fantastic. Um, and you guys have two totally different backgrounds of how you became a doctor. Can you talk to us about how you became a doctor, a little bit about your path to medicine? Sure. So I, I knew always that I wanted to do something healthcare related, something science related. Um, in college, I majored in biology and took a lot of my pre-med courses. So a lot of chemistry, um, physics, biology, and things like that, and then applied to medical school. Um, I actually waited a year after I finished college to apply to medical school. So while a lot of people do apply during college, I actually did want to take some time and um, just kind of work a little bit and then get that experience. And then I applied to medical school. 
And once I was accepted into medical school, I was looking at obviously some options to pay, how to pay for medical school. And that's kind of how I entered this military option. So I knew that I wanted to get lots of unique experiences. I knew that I would either be um, facing a lot of debt or um, considering either some public service options that help pay for medical school. Um, a lot of this is also presented to you as options when you're entering medical school. And so I met with some military members some doctors and eventually decided that this was a really unique pathway to be a doctor. So I decided to be a doctor for the military. And so um, the way that worked for me is I went to medical school, um, not in the military, but just a regular medical school, essentially, um, wearing civilian clothing. And then when I finished medical school, that's when I joined the Navy, officially became active duty, and now I'm a pediatrician in the Navy. Um, following medical school, I did complete three years of pediatric residency to actually learn specifically pediatric medicine. And then since then, I've been practicing at, um, I believe this is probably my fourth or fifth Navy medical hospital as a pediatrician. Okay, that's great. So, Dr. A, can you talk to us about your path and can you also let us know what functional medicine is as you uh, explain how you became a doctor? Sure, absolutely. Let me start by saying, Dr. Burke, thank you for serving our country and thank you for going that route that you did and showing everybody that there's multiple ways to how to be able to serve and become a physician. Um, you don't, there's never one path to, to a particular goal. And thank you for everything that you're doing to, to serve our troops. I have a nephew that just finished ranger training at Fort Benning and he is currently in Savannah and who knows what will hold wow. there. So, so thank you for everything you're doing. So my path was more of the traditional sort of, uh, path on how you, one strategizes to directly get into medical school. I was very, very focused. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, from an early age. So I went to Cooper City High School in Broward County, Florida. Then I went to Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton and I majored in biochem. And if I had it, all, had it to do all over again, we can you know, maybe ask, answer some of those questions that some of the kids might have as far as what should you major in. I probably would not major in a science, but I really stunk at math. So mm -hmm. science was my best route to go. So I majored in biochem and at that time, Florida Atlantic, and they still do, they have a great pre-med science program. And I essentially finished Florida Atlantic in about three and a half years and plan on taking about a year off before I went into med school. But I actually got in uh, unexpectedly, so to speak, uh, at Nova Southeastern University in, in Fort Lauderdale. I lived in plantation, so I would watch that school being built every day. And I was the second inaugural class at Nova Southeastern University on their Davy campus, which is now enormous. And after four years of med school, I knew I wanted to be a family medicine provider. So I jumped right into a family medicine residency, which is three years. So undergraduate studies, four years, um, medical school, four years. The first two years are clinical. The next two years are clinical rotations, usually off site and working in different hospitals. And then I did a three year residency in, in family medicine right here at Wellington Regional Medical Center in Palm Beach County. And the functional aspect happened to where I was not exactly thrilled with where conventional and traditional medicine was taking me and the results that it was providing for my patients. So I thought I wanted to find another, uh, another arsenal that I could have in my bag of tricks to be able to treat patients and give them other options. And that's where I learned about functional medicine. And what functional medicine is, is going beyond the algorithmic approach of how we treat patients by finding a symptom and then giving a pill or seeing a lab or a number and then providing a certain sort of systematic care. It goes back to treating a disease state on a cellular level at the root cause. And that's really where I found my interest and, and my particular type of the way my brain works. I love to play Sherlock Holmes and problem solve really challenging cases and really try to figure out what the root cause of them is at because I don't really like to just prescribe a pill. So it requires a certain type of client that's interested in going in that way and, and trying to solve their medical issues in that way. 
And it takes a lot of training to figure out both sides, the, the conventional medicine side and the functional medicine side. They work best when they're in balance and you're treating a patient with both. So I, I, I'm going to hop into Tasha real quick. Um, he's using some big words, um, yeah, which is okay. Um, but one word I do want you to, to talk about is what is residency? You're, you guys both spoke of a residency. Um, obviously, it sounds like it's a long time of schooling, <laughs> right? You guys have to be in school a lot longer than most careers. But Go ahead, Tasha. And I was going to say, and that's, that's good that you bring that up because that ties into the question that I was going to ask. Um, obviously, the both of you had to spend a lot of time in school, okay? Mm -hmm. And so while you're explaining what the residency is, you, you spent a lot of time. How mm -hmm. did you stay motivated to stay in school? You know, how did you keep that motivation up there so that you didn't just go, oh, that's it, forget it, that's not for me? Yeah, I think, um, and Dr. A, you can chime in here. I believe that it was originally we were called residents because they actually lived at the hospital and never went home. <laughs> and part of that is remains true. Um, so it, it is a lot of training. Like Dr. A said, really the part when you think of being in school for so long, um, it's really two years where you're sitting down in a classroom and learning and being the student taking notes um, being given a lecture. It's two years beyond the four years of college that you've completed. And um, the remaining two years is clinical. So you're in the hospital working alongside a medical team and seeing patients. And then in residency, you essentially you take on um, greater responsibility. So progressively greater responsibility. So um, as an intern, you have to answer to everyone. As a resident, you have to still answer to less people and then you begin to learn how to supervise. And so each year of residency, so for pediatrics, it's three years uh, as well. And so um, that goes into the second question of kind of what keeps you motivated. Each year from the time that you begin entering the hospital, you take on greater knowledge and greater responsibility until you are um, essentially in charge of a patient. And so it's, um, I like to tell medical students that way and tell them that, you know, you're really, you are a student and you're in training, but you begin to feel like a doctor very, very quickly. And that's very motivating. And your patients, um, if you're at a training hospital where um, there's all these different levels taking care of the patient, you're part of a team and that's motivating too, because your patient sees you and you may think that you're just a student and you don't know anything, but your patient sees you and you're a doctor just like the rest of the team and they talk to you and treat you that way. Um, and those are all motivating just to keep you going on. Plus, of course, um, ideally if you find that you like the content and you're excited by what you're actually learning. So it's a combination, I think, of all of that kind of what keeps you going. Yeah. Dr. A? Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with everything, you know, and it is important to know that a residency, you are actually an employee. You're an employee of the hospital. So you are getting paid. You're not getting paid a lot, but you are getting paid. I think when you account, well, when I was a resident and probably when Dr. Burke was a resident, you know, things were a little bit more difficult than they are now because they have work restrictions and limitations mm -hmm. that did not exist when I was a resident. There were certainly many a days where I would leave the hospital at midnight and be back at four in the morning. Um, so I think you, you got paid about $2 and 80 cents an hour by the time you, you calculated what you got paid and, and, and how many hours you worked, but that wasn't the important part really when you're a resident, you're there to learn. And so after your four years of med school, you get your degree, you're, you're a doctor, um, you're an MD or you're a DO, and then you go into residency for your more specific training of where you think you're going to practice. Um, so that's what the residency is. You're working as an employee, usually of a hospital or a hospital network, and you're getting more specific training as to what area of medicine you want to practice. Most primary care specialties, uh, pediatrics, primary care, internal medicine are three years of residency, but some, some specialists like surgeons could have 11 years of residency or fellowship training after med school. Uh, so that's the residency part. Um, the part about the motivation, you know, I, I've really come to understand a lot about that. And after 16 years of really understanding human behavior and working with people and working with young people, I have four kids of my own. You know, what really is important 
as far as that motivational part is you have to understand your why. You know, you have to know why you want to do this. And it's great to have dreams and you should have dreams, um, but then you start to create a passion for something or a vision, which becomes the reason why you want to do it. And then you can make a goal and goals are great, but without action plans, those don't happen either. And then you create an action plan for your goal and then you actually achieve something extraordinary. And those are sort of the steps that you have to take. And if you don't have the right why you want to become a physician, I've seen so many people be horribly unhappy and bitter and jaded and not enjoy and find fulfillment in this profession because they didn't go into it for the right reasons. And I know a lot of the kids listening out there, they're, some of them uh, don't even want to think about what they want to do when they're older. And some of them stress out every day because they think that they're supposed to have an idea of what they're supposed to want to do and they don't yet. And either way, it's uh, unneeded stress. Just start to think about what you're passionate about. Think about why you want to do it. What is the true purpose behind it? And then find a way to make it happen. And you really have to have a strong why to be a physician. If it's because you think they make a lot of money, um, then really you're an entrepreneur and you need to go into something that's more along those lines. You really have to have a strong purpose of a, a desire to serve and to create something outside of yourself uh, that is extraordinary for the lives of the people that you come into contact with to be a, a physician that finds fulfillment in their career. And that's probably the most important part. There's a lot of physicians out there, but not a lot of them are fulfilled in what they're doing. And that's really not a great thing for the patients they're trying to serve either. That is, um, that's some really great advice. Uh, we can all take from that, finding the why. Why is it that I get up every day to do this? And really understanding that to give you more commitment towards your work. Um, here's a question. What continuing training and education is required after you become a doctor? So you are a doctor now. Are you required to still do training and add more ex extended courses or anything like that? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and this is, I'm assuming, like following the completion of residency and you're um, actually out in practice. Um, for me, there's um, a certain amount of continuing credits that I get. And so what that means is, you know, every doctor, you have to stay on top of the latest information. Um, medical care is constantly changing. And so every year um, I aim to do online coursework to stay on top of just, you know, the latest in pediatrics essentially. And then um, also as a naval officer, of course, there's quite a great a bit deal of military training that also goes into just my career in general. And so specifically with in terms of medicine, though, most of my um, continued education is either in the form of going to a conference or doing online programs to just stay on top of the latest. Um, and there's very little actually for my specific state license. There's actually um, very little that's required. I do create a, a great deal of it just because I want to and I like to stay on top of those things. And so I have very little that I'm required to do, but I try to every year to get lots and lots of either conference time or if I can't because I'm in Italy, I don't have the ability to go to the States a lot. So I do a lot of online work. And Dr. A? Yeah, yeah, I believe the actual number is 120 hours of CMEs that, uh, that I'm supposed to be doing every two years. And exactly right, like Dr. Burke said, it's in the form of conferences usually under these strange times of COVID-19. You know, I'm actually due to get some credits done, uh, you know, in the next 10 days, actually. And I can't because there's no conferences because they were all canceled and I can't even get access to online stuff. So I'm in a little bit of a pickle personally right now with some of that stuff. And it is very somewhat controversial too, because uh, there's always arguments as to how many are needed and what are really needed and is it really useful and which associations are tag teaming up with other associations to, they're trying to merge all of our CME hours, you know, between the different branches and associations of medical powers that be, and they're always fighting amongst themselves. And, and so you have to keep up continuing education hours for your board certification and for your license. You have to keep up the ones for your license, but you don't necessarily have to always be board certified. Um, that's something that even some physicians don't even truly understand that, you know, once they're board certified, that runs out, whether it's seven years or 10 years, it's different by specialty. 
and you have to renew your board certification, which means you need more hours and another test and uh, more nonsense. So um, you actually brought up the, the elephant in the room. Um, oh. Yeah, you can't. It's so hard to talk to medical professionals without asking um, this question. And this is sort of a two part question. Um, when you look at your typical day prior to um, COVID-19 and then a typical day now, can you talk to us about what it's like and what the difference is that you're seeing? Yeah, um, this certainly, we, we weren't prepared for this really either. Um, Italy, as, as you know, if you've been keeping up on the news, Italy was hit really hard, um, one of the hardest hit countries with COVID-19. So we had to really put things in place pretty rapidly. And so initially before, you know, in February and before that, my non-COVID life was of a typical busy clinician. And what that means is I do a mix of coming in in the morning and I see kids who come for their doctor's appointments. And then I also see babies who are born in the hospital. And my day was pretty much that. I work pretty much an eight to five, um, 7.30 to 4.30 or so day. And then um, I also am on call to my hospital. And so what that means is I take turns with my colleagues um, being the emergency on-call doctor when there's an after-hours emergency for a kid or a baby. And so all of that changed, of course, um, with COVID, our facilities had to do a lot of downsizing. So I do a lot of virtual medicine now, which um, was something I'm, I'm actually learning this process now because this is not something I was used to 10 years ago when I was in medical school. And so I'm seeing my patients either via phone call or, or um, virtually, and we're trying to handle as much as we can can. We're trying to keep people out of the hospital who don't actually, um, or who aren't acutely sick. And if they are, we're kind of channeling them to a certain area so they're not um, in contact with vulnerable patients. And so my day now is a mix of taking turns with my colleagues in staffing the hospital. And so we've downsized a lot. Um, I do a lot of work at home and I take turns with my um, pediatrician colleagues and actually who goes to the hospital. So I'm at the hospital a lot less now. Mm -hmm. What about you? Yeah, I mean, it's my role is a little bit different in our organization because I'm CEO of the company and we have 16 medical providers uh, within our company. And I have uh, I wear multiple hats, so I have to wear the CEO hat and I have to wear the uh, provider hat on some days. I actually see less patients certainly now. Um, than I ever have before in my career. So my job in the organization is sort of as the visionary component to come up with the what's next strategy. That being said, I was supposed to actually be on a sabbatical this year and <laughs> focusing on some other things. And that all went into uh, an, an abyss. And I don't think I have actually worked as hard as I'm working now uh, in over a decade as far as it comes to leading the organization and in the community with trying to find the right ways to keep everybody safe. We have a hundred team members. So I have to figure out how to keep a hundred team members safe. I have to figure out how to convert an entire practice into telemedicine overnight. We have 30,000 patients in our community of a hundred thousand people. So I have to figure out, and it's really my job along with my team, to figure out how are we going to keep this this whole thing running and still solve this mystery of COVID-19 and keeping everybody safe. So it has been a, a lot of sleepless nights. I don't think that I, I, I haven't slept much in a long, long time because my brain just never stops thinking of, well, how are we going to take our current strategy and, and what the blueprint of what we do in primary care, how are we going to take that and we have to completely throw it away and change it to prepare for this new uh, entity of COVID-19 that is a major disruptor, right? So when you learn about business kids out there, when you take business classes and you, and you learn about different strategies, you're always gonna learn about there's disruptors that come into, into work environments or economies or, or cultures. And this is certainly one of those things that's identified as a disruptor. And for us, we were contemplating strategies before COVID-19 ever was in existence that we're going to change the way that we handle primary care. So what COVID-19 forced us to do is expedite the process 
to hyperdrive warp speed to come up with these strategies that were just visions at one point and thinking of what our ideal vision of primary care was going to be. And now we actually have to create it and deploy it in a very short period of time. That was, that was, that was great. Um, the one thing that I think of is I just, I can't thank you both enough because you truly are, um, you know, on the front lines of this and it's your reactions that help us, um, you know, have a sense of, uh, somewhat sense of calm, you know, just in, in all the work that you're doing um, for us. Um, Dr. A, you brought up a really good point. And also, Dr. Burke, you did too. Um, you guys talked about when you were in school, you took a lot of science classes and biology and stuff like that. But then, Dr. A, you also mentioned um, that problem solving is, is a skill that is very, very, very necessary in what you do. And then you mentioned something about business classes as well. So my question to you and for um, everybody listening is when you think about being a doctor, you think, oh, I just need to take, you know, math and science, math and science. Um, but can you tell us some other things that um, will make you prepared for these things? Like you being the COO and, you know, you being in management sort of positions, um, Dr. Burke. So what are some other subjects that students can take? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's a good question. We're not, um, it's such a small percentage of it is just science. Um, we have a lot of, um, there's a lot of similarities in, in a facility, even in like military medicine. Um, those just translate to naval officer positions. Um, and so leadership is something that is definitely something you develop. I would say, um, I encourage people not to worry if you don't feel like you've been gifted with that because it's something that you develop over time. And so um, being in Navy medicine, it takes, um, you get a lot of experience, of course, leading hospital committees and doing a lot outside. We call those collateral duties, but doing things that are outside of just hands-on patient care. And so being able to speak to a wide ranks of people um, is something that is a good quality. But like I said before, I would um, not discourage people who don't feel that they have that um, from entering Navy medicine, because it's something that you most certainly will develop with experience. Um, and then flexibility, of course, that's just the name of the game for me. Um, part, of, part of the humor in um, my community is a military community. So what was really kind of humorous for all of us is when lockdowns happened and all of the COVID response happened, we were kind of like, well, this is normal military life, not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing, um, being told to just stay home and being told that you can't go anywhere. And so flexibility is just the name of the game in addition to um, learning leadership skills. And so um, being able to talk to people, being able to communicate um, those are things, like I say, you develop those things. You just have to have the passion. Um, I didn't feel whatsoever that um, I would necessarily be good at public speaking or anything like that. But I also um, had a department. And now, you know, I had a medical staff. And so those are just experience things that you gain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Ray? Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely agree. I mean, if I had it to do all over again, I probably would have taken a lot more business classes in, in college. You, you don't have to major in a science to get into med school anymore. Uh, everybody thinks that that's the name of the game. I, I always encourage younger kids to take some business classes, take some human behavior classes, read a lot of books. You know, probably the best book out there for any high school student to read that wants to pick a career is probably Start With Why by Simon Sinek. I think it's a great read for high school age kids. I've already made my older teenagers read it. And one of my kids now is like a Simon Sinek uh, junkie. Um, he, he, you guys will probably know Simon Sinek from TED Talks. Some of the high school students have probably seen some of his TED Talks. But read the book and really understand the book Start With Why. I think it'll really help you out but just become a well-rounded, knowledgeable person. You don't have to pigeonhole yourself into one area of study, I don't believe anymore. And as Dr. Burke was saying, you, there's so many um, areas for growth uh, for people of all types in, in medicine. You don't have to be that standout vocal leader 
uh, you don't necessarily, a lot of those qualities will be, you'll develop them. And, and, and even if you don't want to lead necessarily, there's still a, a very much a strong need for anybody in medicine that's just willing to serve and, and put a patient above themselves and provide quality care. We are in great need of that. And it, it's, it's really important. That being said, uh, I think for the high school kids that might be tuning in, I just see in that generation of culture, a huge opportunity for leaders to really set themselves apart right now. I think that generation is starving for quality leadership. And I think for those that really have a passion and a strong purpose, they're going to stand out and they are going to be the change makers in their generation. I agree. I agree. Um, I believe we have a couple of questions from the chat. So let's see what's going on here. All right. So do you think virtual medicine will now be taught or discussed more in medical school? Now, we do have a lot of uh, medical academies um, in some of our high schools. So this is a great question. Yeah, I, I think mean, most definitely. Yeah, I believe it's not going anywhere. I mean, it, this is where medicine should be. This is what we've been trying to implement even before COVID-19. So we've been working on these telemedicine strategies to begin with anyway, because we have to engage with patients more. The more we engage with a patient, the better quality of care that we can provide. It doesn't always have to be face to face. And that goes for whether it's our, our younger, whether it's the millennial generation or you know the, that 45 to 65 year old a patient that is always busy at work or running the family life and they don't have time to come to the doctor, telemedicine gives them an opportunity to do it at their convenience at, in the comfort of their own home. And even for the 65 and above population, the elderly population, they definitely need a certain amount of face-to-face -face visits. But the more we can engage with them on a consistent basis, even once a month, we're just gonna be providing better care for them. And then oftentimes in the elderly population, they value that communication with their doctor because loneliness is a huge thing in the elderly population. And sometimes their visit with their doctor is actually the only human contact that they might have mm -hmm. in the course of a day. And especially now with COVID-19, where we're having so many people socially isolate, it's a very dangerous thing for loneliness issues in the elderly population. So sometimes just even that telemedicine interface or that phone call with an elderly person is completely the highlight of their day. And that actually has a lot of value in their overall well-being. Yeah, it, it wasn't, learning Learning virtual medicine and telemedicine wasn't um, a part of my training at all. Um, but it's this most definitely has to be at this point. Um, another another thing that um, was said is you, we've now discovered what meetings can be done virtually. And so we'll, we're, we're discovering exactly as we're, we're learning this as we go along, but we're learning what types of medical care can be done virtually. And so um, that extends to us in pediatrics as well. And so lots of um, visits have been able to transition to just being triaged more. And so what that means is just, you know, we've been able to really fine tune things that we could just accomplish online or just accomplish over the phone. Yeah. That's great. Let's see if we have any um, more questions from the chat. It uh, looks like we have one for you, Dr. Burke. Um, do you only work with patients who are kids of soldiers or do you see kids from the local area in Naples? I saw, I saw the question in the chat actually. And I think um, another, I saw another question. Someone asked if I have to know Italian. Um, and so um, a lot of people ask me that question, kind of what's my, patient population as a military doctor. So as a pediatrician in the military, I am the doctor for children and babies of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. Um, I'm, I'm joined the Navy myself. The majority of my patients are children of other members of the Navy, but military hospitals, whether they're Navy or otherwise, they treat all service members. And so the majority of my patients are the children and babies of um, active duty service members who are stationed in the, the, the location that I'm at. And at this point it's overseas in Europe. Um, 
and I've been I've been stationed in other places, and so they, you know, wherever there are troops that families live, and so I've been stationed in Japan. Um, I've done some assignments in Spain as well, and then in a couple of military hospitals in the United States. And so um, wherever there are troops and wherever there are families, there are children. And so um, the Navy will bring the medical care that the families need. So in addition, our hospital, in addition to providing things like um, care to babies, you know, you can be many different types of specialties and be in the military. You can deliver babies in the military. You can be um, do primary care, see psychiatry, things like that. So my patients are military children, largely. Um, I don't, when I'm overseas, like I am now, I actually, I don't see children who are um, local Italian children because they're not um, beneficiaries of the military, the US military system. Um, I am learning Italian. I cannot say I have a lot of skills in Italian, but I'm learning Italian. And that's primarily because I want to love is I want to absorb as much as I can while I'm living here. Um, but I speak English to my patients. So. <laughs> and and what's interesting um, before we go to this second question is that um, your, my my niece, um, was actually born in Japan and she's in Italy right now. She's five and she's learning Italian herself. <laughs> I just had to throw that in because I'm just so <laughs> proud. Anyway. So um, let's go to the next question. Are you finding ways to bring more Eastern medicine into your practice? This is a great question. How do you approach your work from a holistic perspective? Dr. A, you want to start with that? Sure. So um I went to an osteopathic medical school, so I'm what's called a DO. There's two forms of medical doctor in, that are approved forms of medical doctor in the United States and really across the world. And those are doctors of osteopathic medicine, DOs, and doctors of allopathic medicine, which we are, are MDs. So those are the only two approved forms of medical doctor. And the osteopathic training at its core was a more holistic approach, more hands-on um, than at that time when I was going through training than our MD counterparts. And now what we're finding is there's just really this big gray area and this big merge of how of different philosophies of conventional medicine. And there's a lot of MDs that like to practice like DOs and there's a lot of DOs that do nothing but write a prescription and they, they practice like what we used to think only MDs practice. And either way, it, for me, it wasn't fulfilling enough because it was still conventional medicine practices where it's very algorithmic and, and somewhat robotic where you find, you know, through a, a strategy of looking at numbers or looking at symptoms and then providing a pharmacological alternative. And that's not really what I found fulfilling. So we incorporate uh, functional medicine into our practice and it's at the core philosophy of even our, uh, even our traditional medicine providers, they, everyone has an understanding and what it really is, is bringing a lot of lifestyle component into the mix to try to treat a chronic disease with lifestyle and natural supplementation before we just knee jerk and give a pill. So for me specifically, uh, almost 100% of my clients now are treated with a combination of an Eastern and Western approach. And really in our practice in general, a lot of the providers see things in practice that way, because that's honestly, that's how you get the best outcomes for the patient. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You want to add anything, Dr. Burke? Sure. Um, I have a lot of DO colleagues as well. Um, my degree is an MD, so doctor of medicine. Um, but I, I try to incorporate a lot of, um, not necessarily Eastern medicine, but I do have an interest in complementary and alternative medicine. And so um, I'm a member of a, an alumni network through the University of Arizona, and it's a center of integrative medicine. And so um, they have an online fellowship program um, that I completed a, probably about four, four or five years ago now um, that focuses on a lot of botanicals, a lot of herbs. Um, sometimes it's useful and sometimes it's not in, in my career, but um, it's pretty expansive and they have programs also where you can self-educate and you can do modules and you don't necessarily have to be a doctor. So there's a lot of information there that I um, use. And so I still maintain some of the alumni access and try to kind of incorporate it when I can. And we have one uh, final question before I let you to uh, wrap it up with some final words. Um, students may not know that healthcare is very different depending on which country that you're in. 
So doctors, what do you think the biggest issue in healthcare is, um, either in the US or Italy, or um, if you could just talk a little bit about maybe some of the differences. Yeah, I see um, <laughs> where I am. Um, I see some differences, you know, I, I practice US medicine um, in a different country. And, and I've seen it in, um, I was also stationed as a pediatrician in Japan for three years too. And so I learned a little bit about the way that medical care is there because we have patients who, um, the way medical care works at our facilities is that we are a limited hospital. We're not uh, a major, major medical center. And so if we have a patient that gets too sick for us to take care of, we transfer them to uh, a more advanced hospital. And that would mean transferring them to a hospital in the host country. Um, and so you get a lot of opportunities to talk with the doctors there and um, see the differences in how the medical care is delivered. There is a lot of cultural differences, of course. And so um, I learned a lot about how, you know, Japanese culture is different and Italian culture is different. And so, um, and then in terms of barriers and challenges, of course, access is always the biggest thing that I think of. Um, even you just just right in the United States. I mean, access to medical care is just one of the greatest greatest challenges um, that we face compared to other uh, industrialized countries. You want to add in, Dr. Ray? Yeah, and you know, what a cool experience that must be for you, Dr. Burke, to be able to experience what healthcare is like in different cultures and and yeah. just mm -hmm. take some parts of what you learn from one, but then you may have to completely scrap it because it's a completely different philosophy in another culture and then you have to relearn that culture but that that's just a really cool opportunity in my eyes but here in America um, yeah we have the to me the biggest issue is the patient access is a big issue be, but that's almost a ramification of what the main problem is the main problem is is we have a tremendous amount of chronic disease that needs patients to have access because of it and if you go a little bit unpeel the onion as far as to why do we have an access problem? We have an access problem because we have too many people that have chronic disease. We have too many people that have chronic disease because our culture really lacks personal accountability for their health care and doing the right thing to prevent disease. So I would say disease prevention and personal accountability is one of the biggest issues that we have in our culture in the United States because about 80% of the diseases that we take care of on a day in day out basis are essentially self-induced disease states, whether it's diabetes or heart disease. It's, these are the things that if we took better care of ourselves and we educated at a much younger age, proper lifestyle with nutrition and exercise, and we just made people aware that they are in control of their healthcare destiny to a large degree, well, then we wouldn't have as much chronic disease and then we wouldn't need as much access. So in essence, I would love to put myself out of a job someday um, with everybody <laughs> just taking really good care of themselves with nutrition and exercise, because a lot of the disease we take care of can be prevented if we all did that. Well, I certainly do. Um, thank you both for sharing your stories. You know, we we learned about the different paths. We've learned, um, you know, that it is possible to um, go the path of the military versus um, the traditional path. We learned a lot about, um, you know, the different types of medicine that you guys do. Um, there was a big word that you used, Dr. Apatel, that you might want to um, define. You used sabbatical. Oh. Um, so you might want to tell tell everybody what a sabbatical is. <laughs> it's supposed to be my year off, essentially. There you not, go. Your not, year a year, off. not a year off, but I was taking this year to do yeah. some other specific For areas life. of focus. Yes. I was gonna take my my daughter that's 17, and we were supposed to be at a, a culinary school in Switzerland right now that she was supposed to be doing a summer camp in. And uh, it was really supposed to be focused on some things outside of medicine go. and running the business and then COVID-19 came. Right, and so yeah. I do thank both of you um, for your, thank you so much, Dr. Burke, for your service. Thank you, Dr. A. Um, I know that John is gonna pop on in a minute for some final words, but we will also have you um, speak a little bit about 
you know, whatever you want to wrap up with uh, at the end of our um, session today. So John, you want to Awesome. Thank you so much, Tasha. Um, and thank you, Dr. A and, and Dr. Burke uh, for, for this great discussion. It's, um, Dr. A mentioned a couple of words from uh, from something we've been doing a lot in our district too, which is Simon Sinek, Start With Why. Um, you know, I, I think that's a transformational TED Talk. And I think that once you, once you change your thinking of why you want to do something in every problem you solve, not just in your career, but if you approach starting with why from every aspect, it, it's so powerful. So I'm glad you got to mention that. Uh, lots of great skills you guys mentioned that are needed um, beyond just your textbook, reading a textbook, you know? Like it takes a lot more than just book knowledge to be a, good at any career. So thank you for that. Um, as we end today, um, as always, we have the option for you to share your thoughts. So right now, if you're in Palm Beach, it's only for Palm Beach students or teachers. Um, you could either scan the QR code. You can always come back to the screen later too and rewatch the video and pause it here. Or you can go to the bit.ly that we are also putting in the chat box right now. Um, what we want you to do is just share what you thought of this session. Uh, we're gonna take the mixtape. We're gonna make a mixtape and let Dr. Burke and Dr. Apicello see what you thought of this session and what you uh, what you learned from it, and um, you know maybe some aspirations or whatever you want to share with with the doctors, they will get to see that. So please feel free to do that flip grid for us. Also later today we have um, Yaniv from a company called Zipline at two thirty. Zipline is a company that uses drones in Africa to deliver blood to very very remote areas. So they actually use a drone and they fly it to a specific area and then the bottom opens out a parachute with the blood and it lands right exactly where they plan. So um, he's gonna show some really cool things on how they do that in Africa and they're actually expanding. I believe he said they're going to Sri Lanka as well. So um, that's gonna be a great talk this afternoon at 2.30. Tomorrow morning for our everyone, we're gonna be doing a dual language. So we're gonna be doing the Norton Museum of Art uh, in English and in Spanish. So that's going to be a great session at 11.30. No, I don't think that time's right. I apologize. Hang on. Let me check real quick. Nope, that time is wrong. The Norton is at 8 a.m. I can change that right here. Sorry about that. Um, the Norton's at 8 a.m. And let me make sure Manatee is wrong 11 too. 11.30. Wow, I messed this slide up totally, right? So 8 o'clock oh. and 11.30. There you go. So at at 11.30, the Manatee Lagoon is going to be on, and they're going to talk to us about the manatees over there uh, on Singer Island through FPL. So that's going to be a great session as well. So um, all of this is on the website. You can please visit that website. I believe I created a banner here. No, I haven't. But um, it's on our, our EdTech training website as well. So you can just go to edtechtraining.palmbeachschools.org and click on Virtual Learning Experiences. Also, with each of our um, each of our panels, there are some resources for teachers. Um, so we have some articles on medical uh, that the kids can read about becoming doctors. So uh, teachers, please feel free to share those with your students as well. So with that, doctors, we're going to give you guys the last words. Dr. A, you want to give some last words? And we'll end with Dr. Burke. Sure. Thanks. It was really a, a pleasure to do this with you guys. Great questions. And you know, it's the, the those guys in high school right now, they're the next generation of physicians, hopefully, that are going to be coming up and, and serving our culture. And uh, I'm excited to to work with them as much as we, I can personally to help develop the next generation of physicians, because things are going to be completely different uh, in, in the next 10 years than they are right now. And it's really just a pleasure. I thank Dr. Burke for everything that she's doing helping our troops and serving our troops. What, what a, an amazing, brilliant value that you are to them. Thank you. And yeah, please get out there and read Start With Why. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a great way to start your career. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you again. Thanks for having me. I love to talk about this kind of thing because mm -hmm. I knew nothing about it as a medical student um, until some recruiters actually landed on my doorstep. The only other thing I can think of that I'm frequently asked is um, how long do I have to be in the military? And so um, I joined um, the Navy to pay for medical school and they paid for four years of medical school. And the agreement is to serve 
four years in the military. Um, for me, those four years ended, I think, about six years ago. So mm -hmm. I'm about 12 years now in now, and so I just want to leave. The, the, the opportunities are so broad. And so um, I love to talk more about it and um, people can reach out to me if you have specific questions because mm -hmm. um, there's not a whole lot of, of us out there. So thanks for having us. Awesome. Thank you.